ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله indeed all praise is due to allah and as such we should praise him and seek his help and seek refuge in allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever allah has guided none can misguide and whomsoever allah has allowed to go astray none can guide and i bear witness that there is no god worthy of worship but allah and that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the last messenger of allah inna asdaq al hadith kitab allah wa khayra hadi hadi muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa sharr al umur muhdathatuha wa kull muhdathatin bid'ah wa kull bid'atin dalalah Indeed, the most truthful form of speech is the Book of Allah. And the best source of guidance was the guidance brought by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion. For every innovation in religion is a source of misguidance. And all misguidance leads ultimately to the hellfire brothers and sisters we find ourselves in the month of rajab the month of rajab which is one of the months which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to as sacred months Dhul Ka'ada, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. And these months, Allah forbade evil, fighting, etc., in particular. So, special status was supposed to be given to these months. However, no specific form of ibadah was set for Rajab. There is specific ibadah for Al Muharram. We know the 10th of Muharram. We know in Dhul Hijjah, we have a Hajj. Dhul Ka'ada, one who makes Umrah there, it is extended into Hajj, it becomes a part of Hajj. But in Rajab, no specific form of ibadah has been prescribed. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did not perform any special acts of worship in this month. By the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this month was left as the remainder of the months in terms of ibadah, in terms of special acts of worship. However, Muslims, after the blessed generations, the generations about whom Prophet Muhammad sallallahu had said, khairun nasi qarni, the best of generations of people are my generation. ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ Then those who followed them. ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ Then those who followed them. By the fourth generation, after the time of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. People began to add to the religion 
a variety of other forms of ibadah in the month of Rajab and in the other months of the year. In particular, the first day of Rajab, the first night, people ascribed a particular set of prayers to be done, done then called Salatul Raghaib. Salatul Raghaib. Furthermore, I mean, of course, in terms of Salatul Raghaib, it is unanimously held by the early scholars of that period, Imam Malik and others, that it was a fabrication and a lie. <coughs> then a number of different events were ascribed to this month in order to justify additional acts of worship. So the claim was made in that time that Prophet Muhammad was born on the first night of Rajab. Of course, we know that's not what people agreed upon later on even though what was agreed upon later on was still not established historically. There was also claim that he first received revelation in the 27th of the month or the 25th. Of course, this is also known to be false. And the Isra, Mi'raj, the night journey was ascribed to the month of Rajab, supposedly taking place on the 27th of Rajab. Again, no evidence historically sound to establish this date. So, once these dates became known, it was promoted, then worship was promoted also at these times. And special Qiyamul Layl, fasting, etc., on the 27th of Rajab became widespread. But it is bid'ah, innovation. As the Prophet Sallallahu had said, Kullu bid'atin dalala. All innovation is misguidance. So no matter what people say to justify it, saying that we are remembering the night journey, we are just talking about it, reminding people about it, having lectures about it, it's a good thing. No, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing because it is not established historically that it even took place on the 27th. So the foundation is false. Where did the 25th of December come from? But somebody starting to say it was a good thing. Or the date of the Prophet Sallallahu birthday, where did that come from? Somebody starting to say it was a good thing. These are innovations, cursed innovations, according to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, halfway through Rajab, there was an, another prayer. We had Salatul Raghaib in the beginning, first day. Midway through Rajab, Another salat was invented called Salatu Ummi Dawood. Salatu Ummi Dawood. Again, fabrication. Also, a practice quite widespread today in Southeast Asia called 
Conde, where special breads are types of bread is baked and special duas and verses are read over them and they're distributed. It might seem like a good thing. You bake bread, you read some verses over it, make special dua, may Allah bless those who eat it, whatever, and you distribute it. Sounds like something not too bad. But it's innovation. Now if you cooked some bread any day in the year and you made dua and you served it to people is that bid'ah? No. No. You can make dua. It's okay. Oh Allah, I'm going to give this food to people. Please give me a special reward for it. No. There's nothing wrong. But when we specify, when we specify a month, so it now becomes a regular act of worship. It becomes ibadah, which we're establishing in that month. Now we have bid'ah. Something which normally may not be bid'ah becomes bid'ah. Can we understand that? Not everything which is bid'ah didn't have a basis in the religion. Part of the bid'ah which people are involved in has a basis. And that's why it seems so convincing, so attractive, so reasonable. But that is the reality. Once you take a particular form of ibadah which has been specified at a particular time and now you specify it at another time not that you do it at another time you could fast Mondays and Thursdays for example now if you decided to fast instead of Mondays and Thursdays you started to fast Sundays and Wednesdays is that haram? Is that bid'ah? No. If you fasted Sundays and Wednesdays, it's not bid'ah. It's better to fast Monday and Thursdays, but it's permissible, it's halal to fast on Sundays and Wednesdays. Maybe your job situation is such that uh, Mondays and, and, and uh, Thursdays are difficult to coordinate because of the work schedule etc it is problematic for you so you choose two other days to fast instead you'd like to keep fasting a regular two days in the week it's okay that's all right but now if you start teaching people it's good to fast on Mondays uh, sorry Sundays and Wednesdays you start to promote this as special rewards you know for those who pass on Sundays and Wednesdays now you've got bid'ah Something which was okay, you did it for yourself, no problem, but now you've turned it into a bid'ah. Once you start calling people to it, giving it special value, special merits. So something which can be perfectly halal, can become bid'ah when we give it special status. Because only Prophet Muhammad Wasallam has the authority to give any form of worship special status. And he didn't give it special status based on his personal opinion. He gave it special status based on instruction from Jibreel, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's where it came from. So that is why he has the authority to do that and nobody else has. No matter how big the Sheikh is, or how long the beard of the peer is or how holy you think the wali is they don't have the authority because they are not receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we have to break this blind 
worship, really, worship of holy men who we have designated as having special holy status so that anything they say or they do takes on special merit in our eyes. The only person we have like that is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we have to return to that. That's our shahada. That's the meaning of our shahada. And the only person we will take in that way would be Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even fasting in Rajab, fasting in Rajab, was not reported to have been done by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are no special reports of him fasting any days in Rajab any more than Mondays and Thursdays and the three days in the middle of the month. That's it. Nothing beyond that in Rajab. So I ask Allah SWT to purify our religion of these innovations concerning this holy month, this sacred month which Allah SWT has declared to be sacred and that we return to its true sacredness by treating it the way that Allah SWT wanted us to treat it and by following the sunnah of Rasulullah SAW in this month and I ask Allah SWT to forgive what has gone before our past ill deeds with regards to this month whatever innovations we had inherited and cherished and propagated in this month I ask Allah to forgive us for what has passed and to help us to return to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimina min kulli dham fa astaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim I ask Allah to forgive myself and yourselves and to turn to him and seek his forgiveness for he alone can forgive sins. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. Though the month of Rajab did not have any special status with regards to special forms of ibadah, The early generation of righteous Muslims were known to consider Rajab as a part of the preparation for Ramadan. But when Rajab came around, then the consciousness for Ramadan was heightened. Some used to say that we would plant the seeds in Ramadan, sorry, in Rajab, water them in Sha'ban, and reap the fruit in Ramadan. We would plant the seeds in Rajab. Water the, fruit, the plants in Sha'ban, and reap the fruit in Ramadan. Meaning that they began to reflect on Ramadan's coming. And what was necessary for them to achieve a blessed Ramadan. A Ramadan which would be acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherein Allah would bless it with the purifying force of cleaning away sins 
which occurred between this Ramadan and the one previous. From Ramadan to Ramadan, Prophet ﷺ had said, it wipes out the sins in between. So for that Ramadan, the one coming to have that impact, then it had to be done with full commitment. Full commitment to the form of worship we know as fasting. One which goes beyond merely not eating and drinking between dawn and sunset. Though yes, that is the requirement on a physical level. But for it to have a spiritual, an intellectual, an emotional impact, then other things had to be in place. We have to be fasting with a level of consciousness that would actually change the nature of our deeds. Make the month truly a month of fasting and not as it has become a month of feasting. So that, for that to occur, then special efforts had to be made. Special efforts had to be made. And that preparation began as all acts begin that are to be accepted or to be acceptable with sincerity of intention. Sincerity of intention. That we clean the glass before we pour in the contents. So that we will have a pure drink. If the glass is dirty, we pour in clean and beautiful contents, it mixes with that dirt and we have something defiled, not pure. Though what was poured in was pure, it has become impure because the glass itself was dirty. So on that basis, then we try from Rajab, if not before, to start focusing on our intentions. Intentions behind the deeds that we're doing. We continue to fast as normal, Mondays and Thursdays. And the, thir the three days of the month. But we try to be more focused in this fasting. To reflect on what we are doing, make sure we haven't gotten into a habit where it is now a routine. We are on automatic pilot. We don't even think about it anymore. It has become a regular habit. This is why Prophet Muhammad had said that where the intention is not made the night before the fast, then there is no fast. So much importance was put on having that intention for fasting. Not that it's something said, you know, sometimes people have formulas written out that you say this, you say that, you say the other, which indicates your intention. No. But that you have 
reflected and you are doing an act where you have deliberated on it, you have actually thought about what you are doing. So we start to work on intentions in this month. To bring them into line with the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that all of our acts of ibadah, because this is not specific for fasting, ikhlas niyyah sincerity of intention this is not unique for ibadah uh, the, the the for fasting sorry for fasting allah says wama umiru illa liya'budullaha mukhlisina lahuddin they were only commanded to worship allah making the religion sincere for him it's everything the sincere intention is everything. It is what gives ibadah its life. Without that sincere intention, ibadah is a dead corpse. It is a physical ritual, custom and habit. like scratching your head or picking your nose. We do it, but we don't think of special rewards from it. But that's what the other forms of ibadah becomes. No different really. Without that sincere intention that we are doing this truly for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we achieve that sincere intention? Is it something that just happens? We make a dua to Allah, give me sincere intention, and then one morning we wake up with sincere intention. And that's just how it is. Or is it something that we have to strive for? Strive for in particular ways. We have to be clear on that. People are not born with sincere intention. Like some people are born patient. They're just more patient than everybody else. Everybody else has to work on it. Controlling your anger. Some people are just able to control it. Many other people can't. You have to work on it. Sincere intention. Is it like... No. Nobody is born with sincere intention. Because sincere intention itself is an act of worship. The act of worship requires effort on our parts. It requires effort on our parts. We have to reflect on Allah. This relates back to the series that I was doing prior to my absence the last couple of weeks. The series which were focused on what? Dhikrullah. The remembrance of Allah in our day-to-day -day life. Where we're able to remember Allah as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, He gave us the tools. He gave us the various du'as. What to say and to say with understanding. If we were to establish these du'as in our day-to-day -day life, then the consciousness of Allah would be there. That is the automatic consequence. If we're saying it with meaning, if we're reflecting with meaning, then this is the basis of establishing a consistent 
consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that, we can then have correct intentions for the various acts of worship we do in our day, in our week, in the month. So that's what it goes back to. Not anything else different, anything else philosophically, you know, complicated that we have to get into deep thought and no. Simple. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he left that simple example. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us Aqim salah li dhikri. Establish the prayer for my remembrance. Ala bi dhikri lahi al qulub. It is only with the remembrance of Allah that hearts find rest. Inna salah tanha'an al fahsha'a wal munkar. Indeed, salah prevents evil speech and evil deeds. Akbar, And the remembrance of Allah is greater. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us back to his remembrance. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. I ask Allah to bless and to give peace to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to reward him from his bounty for the guidance that he gave us to his remembrance, to the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And I ask Allah to bring this remembrance into our lives with our efforts and make it a part and parcel of our existence to keep us in his remembrance throughout our journey in this world and to make it the last words that we say before we leave this world. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our negligence of the past, to forgive the negligence of our parents and our relatives, our family members, I ask Allah to help us to bring them, those who are living among them, back to this path of true religion. True religion based on the remembrance of Allah and to purify our intentions and to worship Him alone. Aqim as-salah.